Okay, so we got an 800 and we're going to play E4. As always, please save your questions until after the game ends. And we have a Scandi. Okay, we have a Scandi, which we have not had yet. Now, the Scandi is not a bad opening per se, but at this level, we've talked about the fact that it's very difficult to play. Of course, Knight C3 is the move developing with Tempo. And now Black has several... Um, Several retreat. He goes queen back to d8. How do we continue to play? What do we do? What do we do? We can develop our knight, but let's occupy the center first by playing d4 so that he doesn't play e5 or c5. And he goes knight c6. Okay, well, he's attacking our pawn. We could play d5, but we're trying to adhere to basic principles here. So let's play knight f3 and, and defend the pawn while developing our knight. Now, this is a situation where it's time to violate some principles that we have laid out. We could absolutely continue developing. But look at this knight on c6. He's moved his queen around and about so many times that we actually can afford to bend some of the rules and really harass him a little bit because he hasn't developed any of his central pawns. And there is a very clear drawback of that. What can we do? What can we do in this position, ladies and gentlemen? How do we punish the fact that he hasn't moved a single pawn in the center? Yeah, d5. Now, can black take on d5? Nope. We have two defenders and two attackers, which means he cannot take on d5. Well, he does. And see, a lot of people just don't count the defenders and attackers. If there's the same number of attackers and defenders, then you cannot take the pawn. Because if you think about it, the knight is an attacker, but as soon as it takes the pawn, it's no longer an attacker. Okay, we're up a piece. It's a perfect time to practice converting an advantage. Uh, after the game, I'll explain what happens after night before. So let's develop our bishop and unpin ourselves. As I talk about many times, there's two ways, uh, broadly speaking, of converting a material advantage. You can trade pieces or you can use that extra piece or whatever you have to attack. But first and foremost, before we even decide on a plan, we need to complete our development, okay? A lot of people get in trouble because they forget that even though you might be up a piece, fantastic job, but you still need to complete your development. You need to stick to fundamentals, even though you might be up a piece. Now, he goes bishop c5. How do we play here? Where do you guys think that we should position this bishop and simultaneously perhaps follow up on one of these two methodologies. Karl Marksmanship, I completely agree. Bishop e3 is a great move. Let's disarm his bishop. And we're not against a trade because we're up a piece. If he takes, and again, guys, please save your questions until after the game. I promise to get to all of them. What if he takes on e3 with his bishop? Do you guys see on the basis of our discussion of the two methodologies of converting a material advantage, what should we take with? Riemann thinks we should take with the knight. So what's the case for taking with the knight? Exactly. Yeah, everybody's on the same page. We force the queen trade, essentially, because we're simultaneously attacking. The, okay, so he's just like, he's counterattacking our knight. So in what order should we do things here? What should we do? What, like, in what order should we do? And what is it that we should even do? And clutch too, I guess your question will be answered. So what, what do we do? Let, let's trade queens first. Let, let's get rid of this trade. First, let's trade queens, although we don't have to do that. We could have taken on g4 first, but I'm trying to be as methodical as possible. Then we take knight takes g4. He has to take our knight. Boom, we've traded queens. We've won a pawn. We're up a full piece. And it's clear that we have now chosen the second method, which is to trade as many pieces as possible without ruining any part of our advantage or our position. So in the spirit of that, that method, what do we do? How does white continue here? And we can play this move very safely. Rook d1 is good, but why don't we first take the knight? We have a chance for another trade. Does it ruin our position or make a concession? Nope, to the contrary. It ruins his pawn structure. Now let's go rook a to d1, trying to initiate a rook trade. Now in such positions, and we've talked about this before, and he's doing our bidding for us, it's a very good idea to invest a single tempo and make what kind of move? Let's move the knight away and attack his pawn. What kind of move is a really good idea in such positions to take care of our future self? Flight square makes space for the king. We can do that in many different ways. We don't have to always play only h3. We can already play f3. We can move the king out, okay? We don't have to do all that. But first, let's take the free pawn. And I'm not saying we need to do that immediately. 
Okay, so this is a great example of choosing how to make loft. What does our opponent want and how do we prevent it? And actually, I'll give you guys a hint. We don't even need to make loft. We don't even need to make loft. We can kill all of the birds with one stone by going rook to e. This is a move you need to play very carefully, right? If it weren't for the pin, he would checkmate us. If we didn't have this move, I would actually play king f1 in order to simultaneously guard against the threat of rookie two. Again, every single move, guys, you're trying to accomplish as much as possible. So it's, and now I'm just gonna take the pawn and we're gonna win, but it, essentially when you have an idea, do not play the first move that accomplishes that idea. Try to find the best way of accomplishing that idea. So what do we do? How do we win a position like this? Some people struggle with this. What's gonna be the plan? The first thing in such positions, my recommendation, bring the king up. First, bring the king up. Then either promote a pawn or distract his king and promote a pawn. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to win such positions. Okay, so the Scandi, right? Now, the main line in the Scandi is queen a5. That's the traditional main line. Queen d8 is a move. An entire book has been written about this. Now, he goes knight c6, which is already the first mistake. And the first critical moment occurs here. Obviously, everybody's wondering, what the hell do we do if knight before happens? Um, what do we do? Uh, yeah, I'll talk about that, Kasparov. I actually missed that move, but I think we have stuff we can do. There's a couple of things that we can do here, right? Um, I like the move bishop to c4 to defend the pawn, and then we can excommunicate that knight by playing a3. You guys might be, but wait a minute, he goes bishop f5, this is so annoying, he's attacking the pawn. At this point, and this is a slightly higher level piece of advice, we're already at 800. You have to distinguish between activity and pseudo activity. Pseudo activity is sort of a position which looks really, really unpleasant, but in reality, it's all an illusion. You can easily defend whatever your opponent is attacking and then push all of his pieces away in one fell swoop. He is attacking c2. Let's defend c2 by playing bishop b3 or even knight d4, although I don't really like the fact that this intercepts our protection of the pawn. Then we're going to play a3, and we're going to easily get rid of this bishop by playing knight d4. On the other hand, black has a very, very hard time getting his pieces out because e6 always runs into d takes e6. I actually like knight d4 the more I look at it. We can even sacrifice this pawn for rapid development good job proper. In fact, if he takes the pawn, because he's so undeveloped, because his king is so locked in, you need to be looking for tactics. White has a devastating two move tactic that wins the game could somebody spot it please look at his king it has no squares yep Riemann b bishop b5 this would be checkmate we're not for c6 now we go knight takes c6 very straightforward takes takes he's got to give up the entire literal army i mean not only does he give up his queen but he gives up his knight and his rook and that is not a coincidence when you're this underdeveloped that is literally just what happens uh when you try to grab pawns rather than work on more on your development that's kind of terrifying and indeed um that's crazy so that's what would have happened had he played knight before now the funny thing here guys is that as kasparov points out i actually had missed the move e4 and uh what is the idea of the move e4 the idea is that if we move the knight back we'll look at this knight on d5 it's protected only by the queen so the queen is what we call overloaded it protects two pieces at the same time and it cannot keep its protection open for very long and black wins back the piece. So how do we deal? And this is, I would say, advanced, right? We're getting into advanced tactical territory. I'm going to try to make this as clear as possible. How do we deal with a situation like this? Well, we need to reason very, very methodically. The first thing that we need to ask ourselves is can we move the knights and Bishop F, there's probably a couple of good moves, but I think I see one way to solve the problems. Can we move the knight and simultaneously attack el bishop? El bishop. No, actually, that doesn't work. So uh, is there a way to move the knight and attack the bishop at the same time? Could somebody tell me that? And, and defend the bishop at the same time. Yeah, knight d4. But a lot of people would bl blitz this move out immediately, think, okay, great. So it takes, takes. Our queen is no longer overloaded. But the problem is we leave the d5 knight undefended. And now if we take the bishop, then black takes our knight. And again, black has recovered the piece. So that doesn't work. We need to look for alternate arrangements, alternate solutions. And Kasparov indicates one. So what we need to do here is ask ourselves, 
Okay, so we know that we're probably losing a piece. Let's think about it another way. Does e4 make any weaknesses in his position? Does it allow any moves that were not possible before he played e4? Now, knight g5, I'm not sure what's attracting people about this, guys, because this is exactly the same thing as moving the knight back to e1. You lose a piece, right? That's exactly what I talked about. So the move e4, does it create any weaknesses? Does it allow any moves that would not have been possible with a pawn on e5? Anything that you guys can spot, particularly noting that the knight on d5 is super active, beautiful. Bishop f4. Now we're attacking c7, and this is a big deal. If black takes, we take on c7. And I'm going to say that this is a little bit complicated, because after king e7, we have to be extremely careful. If we, take the, if we just gobble up the rook mindlessly, then he plays f takes c2. It's a fork, we have to trade queens, the knight might not be getting out. There's absolutely no need for these shenanigans. This is why intermediate moves are so important. Do not rush to make a move such as knight takes eight. Ask yourself if there isn't something you can do first in order to eliminate all of these annoying, nasty threats. And it turns out if you think in that direction, you know, you quickly find that you can take the pawn. With what? With what can you take the pawn? By the way, this does not win a queen because of f6. Always remember, there might be a way to block your check. Think very carefully, guys. Every tempo is important. You actually take the pawn with a pawn. You take the pawn with a pawn. Why? Why do you take with a pawn? You could take with a bishop. That's also good. You're completely winning here. But from a tactical perspective, you would take with a pawn. Whoa, Vladimir Bello is raiding with a party of 44. Thank you so much, Grandmaster. Uh, Valodia, good friend of mine. Thank you so much. Uh, new streamer. I'll give him a follow. Because we are attacking simultaneously the bishop. We're attacking both the bishop and the rook. Whereas if we take with the bishop, aren't we also attacking the bishop and the rook? Well, it's not that simple, guys. Because now, and, and this also works just because we're attacking the king, but from a tactical perspective, he takes back and we have to attend to these threats. If we take with the pawn, he's got to attend to both the bishop and the rook, and he's simply not able to do that simultaneously. So how do we quantify this into a principle? The principle that I would argue here is that if, if there is a piece, an opponent's piece that's hanging, and we're thinking about making an intermediate move, it's important to try to make that move with tempo so that he can't solve the problem of the initial piece. So what can we say about this principle? I hope, I, I hope this makes sense to everybody. So the move before would have been very unpleasant. But what's the lesson here? The lesson is that when we're in a situation like this, you're always looking for drawbacks. Even when things are not going well, okay, he's attacking two pieces. When, when you can't find a direct solution, you'll look for the drawback of your opponent's move, and that can awaken you to moves that otherwise you just wouldn't have seen because you're too panicked, okay? Um, any other questions? Yeah, bishop h3, the line goes on. I want to pause there in that line because it gets really complicated and we're not quite at that level yet, okay? Um, any other questions? So tempo just means... Literally, it is Italian for time, or well, Spanish for time. A tempo is just like a move, or it's how do I even define it? It's, it's a, that's actually a good question. How do we define tempo? It's it's a single move, I guess, right? It's it's the temporal value of a move. Okay, so it, it, consider the difference between money and a dollar. Okay, money is the concept itself. Money is time, whereas a dollar is a single unit of it. A tempo is the single chess unit. Right, so it's like a single move. When you gain a tempo, you gain a move. What does it mean to gain a tempo? Gain a tempo means, let's say you're attacking your opponent's piece. Your opponent has to move that piece and therefore he gives you one more move. Not the best definition, but I think that gives you a good sense of it, okay? Um, so it's something that your opponent has to attend to which gives you, which gives you a new move. Um, which gives you an extra move, rather. Uh, not quite my tempo. But it could also just mean, um, you know, it, it could mean that in a more general sense. I don't want to get into this too much because I'm going to try to explain this through the moves themselves. Continuing the game. He blunders a piece. Okay, so we play bishop e3. And at this point, how do we decide between these two moves? Well, we decide between these two moves because we see that if we take with a knight, we basically force a queen trade. We actually do not totally force a queen trade. He can keep he can keep the queens on the board. How? How can black keep the queens on the board and save his bishop? 
could somebody please explain to me how to to keep uh queen c8 is one way but but the best is to play bishop back to d7 if you play queen c8 then white takes on g4 alarm bells ringing boom 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 what do we do now what do we do now as soon as we see an x-ray this is a standard garden variety x-ray situation and we exploit that x-ray by moving the knight out with maximal with maximal damage black knight takes c5 very good and that's it then we're going to take the knight we're up a piece we have the e-file open this is now knight takes c5 wins the tempo right we attack the queen he has to attend to that queen giving us another move it's basically kind of like we're playing two moves in a row obviously we're not but his move is kind of empty because he just has to move his queen okay um so bishop d7 would have kept the queens on the board but this is a huge concession it makes his pieces very passive one option here is to centralize our queen and then attack d5 there's many ways to play this but anyways don't want to delve too deeply here takes the queen takes the bishop takes bishop c6 literally just trading all the pieces trading rooks as well centralizing the knight taking now here just very very quickly had rook to eight not been possible let's say his king would have been on g7 the move king f1 i want this to make sense to everybody why is this better than h3 because h3 allows him to infiltrate with rook e2 this is not the end of the world we can drop our knight back and attack the rook force it back but again h3 is the most careful move because it, it actually kills three birds with one stone it brings the king closer to the center, which is something you want to do in the end game. It stops rook e2, and it also prevents the back rank checkmate. Hey, Lily. Good to see you. So this is the kind of uh, multi-purpose move that you want to make um, many times throughout the game. And at the end, the game is over immediately. King f1. How do we win a position like this? Well, the first thing I'd do is I'd centralize the king. And it depends where, where black, at some point, you would start playing a4. And there's two fundamental ways of winning a position like this. I mean, even without the knight, it's kind of the same thing, right? Bring the knight back. You can directly promote the pawn using your resources to promote this pawn. You can also use this pawn as a decoy. This is what I would probably end up doing, trying to distract his king. And then in the time that his king spends attending to the pawn, you then come around and take all of these pawns and promote your pawns. So this is how this would look, right? You would just come around and vacuum up these pawns. And um, if you wanted to actually just promote the pawn without going around, then you would literally stick to the queen side and you would use the other pawn to prepare a5 and et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to delve too deeply into this. I think most people can comfortably realize an advantage like this. Art Sachstrom. All right, so he goes g3. Well, in such situations, we already know the rule of thumb. We simply occupy the center. Again, this is one of those openings where we don't really need to overthink things. Let's just develop our pieces again and again and again. We see this hammered home. He goes d4. Now, we've already been in this situation where we need to decide between two things. What are we deciding here? What is Black's main decision? What is Black's main decision? Whether to do what? Closed? or open or push. So what do you guys think? Should we close the position here? We can actually do either. I mean, either is good, but I wanna give you guys some more practice closing the position up. I wanna show, because a lot of people, and I don't wanna put words in anyone's mouth, um, but a lot of people uh, just don't have that intuition about playing in closed positions. We had one of them before in this speed run. Uh, which is more like a slow run, but that's why I called it a speed run, just a little bit of a troll. Uh, it is a slow run. But I want to reinforce these concepts. Now, he plays this correctly. He goes C4. Remember, guys, from the last time, you want to attack the base of the pawn chain. So how do we react here? We don't really take the pawn because that would make our center collapse. We instead protect the pawn with another pawn going C6, building what's called a pawn chain. He's go he goes queen C2, which is a bit of an aimless move. And uh, this allows us simply to continue developing, which we are going to do by bringing our bishop out. Whoa, he goes, so he's just doing all this stuff that's, that's you know, we, we don't want to dismiss it. We don't want to ignore it, but we just want to continue developing, okay? We, we basically do ignore it. He's moving his pawns while we're, we're developing our pieces. But let's try to decide now how we will continue our development. Where do you guys think that we should put this bishop? Where does this bishop on c8 belong? Also bearing in mind what he just did. He played h4. What is the consequence of the move h4? The consequence is that he can no longer play h3, 
which means we can slam this bishop onto a really weak square. It's kind of like an outpost for the bishop. He continues to expand. Now here's the thing, guys, and this is, I know, going to be hard to swallow, but there comes a time when he's so undeveloped, so undeveloped, that we actually need to open up the center, even if that means opening up and destroying our own pawn chain, okay? There are situations that are, it's so important to open the center that it's even worth sacrificing the integrity of the pawn chain to open up that center because what you guys are gonna notice, and I will talk about this in depth after the game, there, chess is a game where you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. And here, because he's so undeveloped, he's going to pay the price for it even though we don't have um, a pawn chain. He's made an even worse move. He's given up the only piece that defends all of the weak light squares around his king. So it's going to be very important to adhere to two principles. Thank you so much, Inquis. One is going to be to play actively to play with tempo. The other is going to be to keep our eyes on the price, keep opening up the center when possible, but to protect all our pawns. So can we defend this bishop with tempo? To answer our first question, can we defend this bishop with gain of tempo? We can. But Daniel, aren't you moving a pawn in front of the king? Well, I addressed this earlier, right? Yes, we are, but look at White's pieces. All of his pieces are on his starting square, and he thinks he's a genie. He won a pawn. I don't care. Let him take this pawn. We're going to keep opening stuff up and ripping apart the center and the queen side. How else do we open up the position? Any other pawn breakthroughs? Remember, f4 is not working. Are there other pawn breakthroughs we could execute? Are there any? Yeah, let's go a5. Let's open up that queen side too. The more we open up, the harder it's going to be for him to uh, protect his pieces and his weak pawns. Yeah, thank you. Oh, look at that file. That's a juicy file. Can we occupy that file with one of our pieces? That beautiful C file. Let's occupy that file. How can we do that? And I know that I'm getting low on time, but don't worry. If I get down to 30 seconds, I will take over. Yeah. Defending, attacking the bishop. Now, do you guys remember when he played h4? A move like h4, you need to be very attentive to because it creates a lot of weaknesses. In particular, you guys see this card? What can we do with the g3 pawn? What can we do with that g3 pawn? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, let's take that pawn. Absolutely, because what's going to happen is that he's so undeveloped as soon as we open up the position, peace is a very small price to pay. And I'm, I'm, how do you know that? Well, I know that intuitively. I'll explain a little bit more of the thought process. I'll explain a little bit more of the thought process after the game. But by and large, a lot of people should see this, right? You can see how overwhelmingly better developed we are. And all that remains after he plays king f1 is to open up the position a little bit more. And he's just going to collapse. So what do we do after king f1? How do we continue opening up the position? A certain move that used to be impossible is now possible. Yep, bingo, Dr. Lono. Get ready, because we are about to crush. Knight f3, how do we proceed? Okay, he's just sort of collapsing. He's trying to throw water onto the fire. Um, what, what do we do? What, what do we take? What do we take? And we can take several different things. Um, we can take the knight or we can take the pawn. Both moves are fine. Um, but what do we do first? Well, let's, let's take the knight first, okay? Because um, we attack the rook, and if he's offering us that material back, let's just deal with that so we don't have to worry about it. And now after king g1, okay, he goes king e one so what do we do now? And this speaks to the concept of flexibility, right? We don't want to pre-move f takes d3. He's offered us a rook. We're just taking a rook, and we're still attacking. This game is over. Notice that I... Still haven't taken, I finally take on e3. And how do we actually win the game using one of the main principles we have discussed, which is that when you're up so much material, what you often wanna do is just bring all of the rest of the pieces into the game. That's going to make it so much easier to actually deliver the checkmate rather than hunting for the mate with very few pieces. Rook f3 is fine, but let's practice that art of bringing pieces in. I know this isn't the best move, I know I have 24 seconds left, don't worry, I'll win. But I still want everybody to practice always bringing pieces in. When you get obsessed with that, you find that this allows you to win the game 
in a far easier manner. After king c4, how do we win his queen? I want to hear a move before I make a move. I want to hear someone say the move. Come on, guys. Queen, e2, bingo, you say he got it. And now I can actually win. Rook f5. If he goes d5, I take it. Ba boom. Boom. Now I'm up a queen, and then I'm going to take his bishop, and the game is over. Red Rover. And those of you who are holding your press, do not, because I am experienced. But don't try this at home. Check. And where is the mate? Where is the mate? Okay, I'm giving it away, of course. Check, mate. You see how easy it was after I brought my pieces in, and I'm sorry for the time scramble at the end. This guy was good. He was resilient. He was not bad at all. And you can see that these guys are resisting a little bit better. Okay. Now let's unpack this game. So here, if you did not want to close up the center, you could also play the move knight c6, which would be entirely possible, entirely doable. Um, but I want to close up the center because I want to show you guys a little bit more how to play with the center being close. So he goes queen c2 and he starts playing all these pawn moves. This is what people often do. He just doesn't know what, what he's doing. I mean, he does not know what the plan is. Bishop g4, and this is the key moment in the entire game. Now, you might be asking, why was there such a necessity to open up the center? Well, the thing is, if we continue developing, then he kind of justifies, you know, what he's just done. How can he now proceed on the queen side and um, close things up and, and start attacking actually and, and this is why partially yep this is partially why now he can start developing maybe he wouldn't have but this is partially why it's so hard to play with closed positions because not only do you have to handle the intricacies of the closed position itself but you sometimes have to recognize the moment when to open the position up okay that's why we took because none of his pieces are developed he should have taken the c4 pawn. And now we could have ripped the position open further by playing a5, a move that we played later on in the game. He gets into big trouble here because he cannot keep things closed for very much longer. Okay? How did I know that that's the right time to attack? Well, I realized that if I gave him one more move, he would have played c5. That wouldn't have been terrible, but I did not want to give, them, give him that opportunity again. Okay? Um, so that's basically the intuitive backdrop behind d takes c4. Now, here, I could have not allowed queen e6 check. I could have gone queen d7, okay? Um, and that would have been perfectly fine. I didn't have to play with tempo, but I wanted to emphasize that sometimes it's very important to play with tempo. I also wanted to emphasize that sometimes pawns are not important, and this is one of those situations, okay? This is one of those situations. Yes, he's up a pawn. Look at this. His queen is the only piece that's developed. All of his other pieces are underdeveloped, are undeveloped, which means two things. First of all, we need to keep opening up the position. Second thing, we have to operate with a sense of urgency. What happens if we don't operate with a sense of urgency is that with every piece that he develops, he minimizes our initiative. He minimizes our advantage because our advantage is dynamic, which means that it can evaporate at any moment. If he develops two or three pieces, well, guess what? His position is still riddled with holes but it's not nearly as bad as it would be here. So that is why we play a5, okay? He goes b5, opens the c file, and now we go queen c7. Dynamic and static are opposites. Attacking the bishop and also eyeing that g3 pawn. How did I know to eye that g3 pawn? Well, as I said, the moment he played h4, I made a mental note in my mental database of observations. Look at this pawn. Always look at this pawn. As soon as I play queen c7, a sacrifice is now on the table. This is the importance of observation. I've talked about this since the very first game of the speedrun. Chess is not only about looking for moves, you know, about calculating. It's also about observing, making observations, just like in the scientific method. Okay? The more you observe, the more you note down, the more informed and the deeper your ideas eventually become. And it's not rocket science to make an observation like this one. Okay? So I, I noted that pawn, and this is when I remembered it, because it's easier now for me, after so many years of experience, to keep these observations uh, in, in my mind. Um, I get it until contact with the pawns. Exactly. Knight d2, bishop takes g3. Okay, so this sacrifice should now make a lot of sense to everybody, because we have such an overwhelming number of pieces already in the attack. Now we're trying to open up that f file. Now in this position, and I don't think I'm doing SCC. I did do the junior SCC. What would happen if white played E4? And this is the move that would cause a lot of people concern because it looks like he keeps the F file closed, 
But again, we need to be very flexible. We need to take stock of all of our attacking pieces and see which ones can now participate directly in the attack. And this move, this move ends the game because it threatens essentially checkmate. And if he takes, well, then we open up that F-file. So this literally just walls close in around White's gang. The game is over. Instead, he went knight f3, trying to throw his body between me and the king. But it, it doesn't matter. And here, I just decide to take all of his pieces. Now, here, a lot of people, yeah, why not rook f3? Kind of ladder checkmate. He has to cover with his queen. We win the queen. Again, I'm not saying this isn't the best move. It probably is. I'm trying to emphasize the general concept of bringing the pieces in very patiently so that then the win becomes a little bit easier. By the way, at the very end, this is a very simple tactic. I'm seeing that the king is defending the queen. It's overloading. You are distracting, I guess also a decoy. You're distracting the king from the defense of the pawn. It's a very, very simple mechanism uh, that most people should see intuitively. But I will point out a piece of advice here, which is that um, the two worst defenders, and listen closely because I'm going to make a couple qualifications here. The two worst defenders of a piece are the king and the queen. When the king or the queen defend a piece, that piece is generally very, very vulnerable. Why? If they, it, it, That's counterintuitive in the queen sense because you might think the queen is the best defender, but it's the worst defender. Because the moment a queen is attacked, it has to move. The moment a knight is attacked by another knight, sometimes you can reinforce that knight. But when a queen is attacked, it essentially has to move and abandon whatever piece it's defending. And the same exact thing goes for the king. The king, by law, by the laws of chess has to move when it is attacked, that is check. And so it comes above everything else. The king is a very selfish piece, so it must abandon whatever piece it's protecting. You guys see what I'm saying? So just keep that in your mind. Any questions before we move on to perhaps the final uh, or the penultimate game of the speed run? I appreciate everybody's support and all the subs and, and everybody just participating. It's awesome and uh, thank you for also respecting my wishes in terms of politics, uh, Dre, speaking of subs and support, Dre, TH95 with two months, appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, fantastic, let's move on. I guess, okay, 810, Nishan Tamundas, and here we're actually going to play an opening other than what we've been playing so far. Well, he's done that for us, so he's played D4. And let's play d5. Let's play it classically, conventionally. It goes a3. Okay, so this is already a bad move, which basically means we can develop, and he's giving us a lot of time. Now, the move e6 would not be actually optimal. What would be the optimal scheme of development here? And the way to understand that is to realize what the drawback is of the move e6. If you guys know what the drawback is, you know that you want to first develop the bishop outside the pawn chain, and then play e6 and prepare the development of the other bishop. Okay, so he's making moves with the same piece. He seems like he's intimidating us. Let's ignore him. Let's just keep developing. And you guys will see quickly that this... Okay, well, this is just ridiculous. He has absolutely no pieces to exploit this, you know, slight weakening of our king. Expected lemon. Thank you for the five months. Now, how do we continue? How do we continue? What do we do? You know, how do we actually coordinate our forces? Justin Haikus. Thank you. Let's castle. Let's finish castling. Now, in such situations, as Yazazi and others are pointing out, it's a very good idea to ask the bishop. Okay, so he does our bidding for it. H6 is a great idea sometimes because if bishop h4, we would later be able to play g5 should we need to get rid of the pin. Now, let's continue what's called castling by hand. That would be playing rook f8. Now playing king g8, and that's as simple as that. We just move our king, and we've essentially castled without actually castling. Do we care about the double pawns? We do not, because he's helping us trade pieces. What do you notice now about this position? What do you guys notice? Um, and, and what observations can we make that might motivate us to decide between trying to trade pieces and trying to attack? Now, we've got the open f file. Not only do we have the open f file, we have access to the semi-open g file with the king. Can we exploit the f2 pawn? If we didn't have the bishop here, it would be mate. But it actually turns out, and I'll give you guys a little bit of a hint, it's very hard actually to exploit that because, and I've mentioned this before, be very careful when you're considering a move like bishop d3. Because he takes with the queen and he simultaneously vacates the, the d1 square for the knight. 
Bishop takes c2, he takes with the queen and defends f2. The advice specifically that I have to share is when you're considering a discovery, specifically a discovery, make sure that he cannot take the piece that delivers the discovery and simultaneously defend the pawn with the square that you're trying to target. That is one of the most common sources of mistakes. Instead of this, I'm gonna go queen g6, and I'm going to redirect my attack on this incredibly weak g2 square. But can't he castle? Well, he can, but this walks right into a very, very typical stock tactical pattern. You can take this, but let's keep our eyes on the prize. There's a far greater prize, which is, of course, the king. We go bishop h3, we force him to go g3. We're gonna win another exchange, and we are going to end up simply up a full rook. Yes, we don't no longer have an immediate attack, but, well, never mind, I guess we do have an immediate attack. <laughs> yeah, he's not exactly in the best of form, it seems, in this game. But again, uh, he also, yeah, well, that, okay. Well, let's just end the game here with Queen takes you too. Yeah, um, in any case, just, I guess this will be a quick one. Uh, every, it, it should make sense to everybody that the movie six is suboptimal because it blocks the bishop. But those of you who know the Queen's Gambit know that Black often plays e6. And I, I mean the opening, not the show. So you might be like, well, Daniel just told me Queen's Gambit is bad. I see Hikaru and others playing the Queen's Gambit. Is the Queen's Gambit then bad? It's not bad. The Queen's Gambit is one of the most reputable, one of the most solid openings in existence. But when you're playing Black, you sometimes have to play an opening that contains a drawback. Almost every opening has drawbacks, particularly with black. And you could play bishop f5 here, that's called the Baltic opening, but the drawback of that is that he can take on d5 and essentially destroy black center. Okay? So I just wanted to make clear, the king's, queen's gamut is not terrible. It's an incredibly good opening. Uh, but given the opportunity, we can basically play the queen's gamut on steroids. If you play c4, we play e6, and our bishop is outside the pawn chain. Thank you, 011 Vlad110 for the Twitch Prime. Let's keep that hype train going, this is awesome. Um, thank you guys so much. Okay, so the rest was very straightforward. Now, what would we have done? What would we have done? And Jelly asks a great question. Well, why the hell not bishop g4? The move bishop g4 might have walked into knight e5, um, and you're pressuring this bishop. That's really the only reason. This is not even bad. We can now bring the bishop back to f5. But there's really no reason to uh, to allow this move. Curious chimpanzee with five gifted tier one subs to the community. Thank you so much. Incredible stuff going on. Tussinator, Carso, Triple N, Griller, King Killer, 88, and Razlos. Uh, receiving the subscriptions. Thank you so much, Curious. Always so supportive. Okay. So what would we have done had he simply and one ND7 gifting a sub to Shivalan? Yeah, this is incredible. How would we play in a position like this after castling? Could somebody explain to me a good plan in this position? Yeah, I'll, I'll, 100 bits, Scorgies are key. Thank you, Tortuga, it's grande. And what would be the plan here? Yeah, so you guys really are aware of the ideas. You would go C5 to undermine the D4 square, which brings me to a detour. I myself play an opening called the Jababa London, you zazy five, holy smokes. DP, B67, momentum. Kyle, speaking of momentum, Kyle, Motto, Missy, Marvin, and the Hound of CS. The move knight at knight C3. Move knight c3. It's not the same as going e4 and knight f3 because the move knight c3 blocks his ability to either go c3 to protect the pawn or c4 to contest black spawn. That's why this is not a standard move. I still play it for a you know other reasons that I won't get into right now, but that's the reason why knight c3 is often frowned upon in queen's pawn openings precisely for the reason on full display here. The d4 pawn is now under significantly more pressure than it would have been if white would have been able to play c3. After he castles, we can go knight bd7 and try to get this knight out of e5. That's why it's only strong piece. If we can get this knight out of e5, we have fantastic coordination between our pieces. We have the ability to attack on the king side and the ability to pressure the queen side, perhaps by bringing the rook to c8. Okay, that was a lot. Um, I hope that that makes sense to everybody. Any last questions? After he took... I really don't have to get into this. We just castled by hand and played queen g6. Just to show, the move bishop takes c2, very, very common blunder. To repeat that piece of advice, when you are looking for a discovered attack or a discovered check or discovered whatever, make sure 
that you are not, let's say, sacrificing a piece and allowing your opponent to recapture it and simultaneously defend whatever square or pawn or piece you are trying to discover the attack on. Okay? I hope that that makes sense. A little bit of clunky wording. I'll, I'll work on it, but I think that the, the gist of it makes sense. What about bishop? Yeah, bishop h3 would be possible. Uh, and perhaps he could castle here, and then we could play queen g6. So we could do the same transposed. That would be acceptable. Bishop e4 would be acceptable. Would bishop d3 be acceptable, according to the application of our advice? Would this move be acceptable? Because he can't take this way or this way. But what could white do here? It would not. Why not? Why wouldn't this be acceptable? Queen takes d3. And unfortunately, he's opened up this d1. So now black is still attacking. Black is still much better. There's really no, no point here. Now, bishop e4, he would castle. After queen g6, he could play f3. We don't have the same thing we did in the game. Unfortunately, the bishop has to move. We could take c2. We're up a pawn. But we're not up an exchange, right? With, with queen g6 and bishop h3, we win an entire exchange. And we're up an entire rook, given that we were up a piece already. Okay? Let's proceed, if everybody's ready, on to the next game. 